be here say amen. amen. I don't know whose pen this is, but thank you very much. I'll <laughs> just take that back to the church office, Scott. Um, we are glad that y'all are here. We got just a, uh, just a couple of things to make you aware of. Uh, first of all, we want to make sure that you understand that this Wednesday night, there is not a meal beforehand, and it starts at 6.30. It starts at 6.30. Uh, we're going to have a great, a great time. Scott, there you go, buddy. Uh, starts at 6.30 Wednesday night. We want you to be part of that. We're going to have a, a fantastic time of a, of a devotional time together in our atrium, and then we'll have an ice cream Sunday bar slash banana split bar, so it's going to be fantastic. You are not required to bring anything. Uh, this is the, uh, the fellowship committee is providing this for you, so uh, please show up Wednesday night at 6.30. Also, on Tuesday night, uh, Jan Hines is having her prayer night. This is a good time for every, anyone to come out here and, and to just kind of be still in the auditorium and just, and, and just pray and listen and, and think about things that, that God, is, uh, God is doing in your life. And finally, we have some uh, good news. Uh, we have a family that is, uh, I guess you could say, is coming back home. Uh, they're coming back home to, uh, to be with us here at Western Hills. We are excited about that. If I could have the Shelton family stand up where they're at. So, yes. There you go. All right. Y'all going to have to see enough of them. Uh, it's Connie, Joe, and, and Greg. Greg is not here today. He is at home mourning for the Alabama loss. But, uh, but no, no, seriously, Greg works every Sunday, so it would be very rare that we will see him. He, he works every Sunday, but, but Connie, Joe, and Greg, and, and Taylor, and Sonia, and Hendrick, and Taylor, of course, is at MTSU. I believe he's a sophomore. His major is girls, so... Uh, uh, no, I think it's sports medicine, sports medicine. Right, Connie Joe? He is a junior. Is he really a junior? Oh, no. Wow, I cannot believe that. That's unbelievable. I am definitely getting, uh, getting a little bit older. That is, wow. He just graduated, didn't he? That's, that's incredible. So he's a junior. Um, we're glad that y'all are here. In fact, if you want to, go ahead and, and turn to somebody next to you and say, I'm glad the Sheltons are back. Go ahead and say that. Uh, because I know the reason why, why I want you to say it, because I know some of you are thinking that. Man, I'm glad Connie Joe's back, so you just need to go ahead and say that. Uh, but uh, but we're, you know, we're excited that you're here. Uh, Western Hills is just a great place. If you're visiting with us, we want you to stick around. You're an honored guest. You need to stick around for our Sunday school program. We have great classes for adults and kids. And today, in our sermon, we're continuing our series on the road to recovery. And we're looking at the road to recovery because very simply... We are imperfect people that live in an imperfect world. Uh, no one in this building has it all together. Uh, we all sin. We all sin daily. We all struggle with things. Uh, we all have habits that we want to break. We all have hurts that we're trying to get past. We all have hang-ups that we're trying to get rid of. Uh, we're just people that are just imperfect. We're people that, 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 that are kind of messy. You know, we don't have the puzzle put together yet. There are pieces of the puzzle that are missing. There are pieces of the puzzle that aren't fitting in together. And, and so we are all on this road to recover together. We're all trying to figure out things and how we can grow as Christians. In fact, we're kind of like the, uh, the driver of a, uh, of a pet store truck that I heard about one time. He, uh, he picked, up, uh, picked up one of those big box trucks. I don't know if you, if you know what I'm talking about. He picked up a big box truck, and, and he, was, he was driving down the street. And every time he came to a traffic light or a stop sign... He would put the, the truck in the park, and he would jump out, and he would run to the back of the truck with a two-by-four. And he would take the two-by-four, and he would hit the side of the truck as hard and as loud as he can. Boom, 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 boom. And he kept doing this. Every time he had a chance to stop, he would jump out, hit the side of the truck with a two-by-four. And people behind him were like, what is he doing? This makes no sense, you know. Uh, and so finally... Finally, somebody yelled out, the, yelled out their window, Hey, buddy, what are you doing? And the guy said, Look, you have no idea what I've got myself into. I'm driving a two-ton truck, and I've got four tons of canaries in this truck. And so I'm running back, and I'm hitting this truck with a two-by-four to keep two tons of the birds in the air at all times. And, uh, you know, that's kind of strange, but you know what? I think we're a lot like that man. I think we try to keep so many things in the air. We try to juggle so much stuff. And, and, and if you're like me, 
sometimes life just gets the best of you. Constantly running around, constantly trying to do things so you don't crash or, or you don't become overburdened. Uh, and if you're like me, you, you oftentimes you get stuck in a rut. You ever been stuck in a rut and you, and you want to change paths, you want to do something different, but it just seems like that it's almost impossible. You get stuck in a rut sometimes. Sometimes you, uh, you, you deal with the same struggles. I mean, I'm a 41-year-old man, and there are things that I struggled with when I was a kid that I still struggle with. Sometimes you deal with the same struggles. Sometimes you deal with guilt that, that haunts you in the past. Uh, sometimes you struggle with the fear that people are going to actually see the real you. And, and if somebody sees the real you, if you finally take off your mask here at church and you come into this building and you're actually the real you, will people actually love you? And so there's all these things that we're dealing with. And it's, we are like that driver in the truck. Life's crazy. It's hectic. We're carrying four tons of stuff in a two-ton truck. And it just seems like we just need some rest, some relief, some help. And so we come to the road of recovery. This is our third step. Step number one on our road to recovery was, was that we need to realize that I'm powerless and that my life is unmanageable. And this is the humility step. The, step. the first step is we've got to realize that we don't have it all together, uh, that, we, that we, our lives are a mess, and that, that I cannot straighten out my life by myself. In fact, if I could, I would have done it a long time ago. I mean, if I could roll up my sleeves and, and put my life all back together, I would have done it. I mean, I really would have. I don't know if any of y'all are like that. But if I could have done it myself, I would have been glad to have done it. But I can't. Which leads us to the second step. The second step is that we have to earnestly believe that God exists and that He has the power to change my life. We have to be humble, and then there has to be a step of hope. We have to say that, that, that yes, we can be better. There is hope in my life. I don't have to stay stuck in a rut or, or, or still struggle with the same sins or, or be caught up in the past. I can actually be somebody that God wants me to be, which leads us to our third step. Because finally, you have to consciously choose to commit your life to Christ's care and control. You have to make a conscious choice. You have to say, you know what? I'm tired of being where I'm at. I'm going to commit my life to Christ. Uh, if you got your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. This is the invitation that, that, that Jesus sends to us today. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus offers a timeless invitation. He comes to us in Matthew chapter 11 and he says, Listen, if you're weary and burdened, I want to give you rest. If you're stressed out, if you're, if you're burdened with sin, if you're struggling with things, I want to give you relief. And I want to come to you gently and humbly. I want to come to you and I want to be in your life. Now, I want to take control of your life. Like that song that we just talked about, Lord, take control Jesus says, I don't just want you to come to me and get all the blessings. I want you to come and be blessed, but I also want to take control of your life. I want to lead you. I want to be your Lord. It's not enough for, for Jesus to be your Savior, but Jesus also has to be your Lord. And Jesus says, I want you to commit my life. I want you to commit your life to me. It's a timeless invitation. But in Matthew chapter 7, just a few pages back, Jesus knows that not, not everyone is going to hear this invitation. And obey it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate. And narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Matthew 11, Jesus offers a timeless invitation to the entire world for relief and rest. But in Matthew 7, he backs up and he says, but I, only, I know that only a few, only a few will find it. 
So this morning, we're going to try to find out if we have a few people in here that have found it. And we're going to get a little serious today. Um, I, want you to a, uh, I want you to put a spiritual mirror in front of yourself for the next few minutes. I want you to try to make the next 10, 15 minutes just about you and God. Behind me sits five chairs. You may be wondering, since you've been in here, what are these five chairs about? Uh, maybe some of you have said, wow, I wonder if this is a... Uh, one of these chairs or the, or the amen corner. You know, it'd be great to have some guys, amen, that's right. Uh, uh, these are actually the people who show up late after communion. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, five chairs. Five chairs. Uh, five stages of life. And everybody in this room sits in one of these chairs. Uh, one of these seats is for you. In fact... We could even go a little bit farther than that. We could say everybody in the entire world right now at, at 9.52 on this Sunday morning, every person in the world belongs in one of these five chairs. Now, all of these five chairs, there are two of them that you want to sit in and three of them you want to stay away from. Uh, so... If there's five chairs and two of them are good, you have a, a 40% chance of being in the right chair. Not, not bad percentages. Uh, so so here's, here's what they are. Chair number one. Chair number one is the chair of the, for the innocent child. It's the chair of, for, for innocent people. This is the chair for innocent adults. This is the chair that people sit in that just can't quite grasp how to consciously choose to commit their lives to Jesus. Do you, you know what I mean? These are the people, you know, I, I think when I was growing up, we used a term, age of accountability. I don't know if y'all ever heard that. Uh, there was a term, you know, at some point in, a, in a someone's life, they reach that, that magical age of accountability, whatever that is. I mean, I don't know, you know, there's no magical formula to say, once you hit 12 years old, son, you know what's right and wrong, and you need to be baptized. Or once you hit nine, or maybe you ought to be 18. We don't, there's not a magic number. But this chair is for those people. Innocent children and innocent adults who are unable to make a conscious choice to commit their lives to Jesus. Because if you're going to be on the road to recovery, you've got to choose. I mean, this is the step where the rubber meets the road. I mean, this is a step where you have to say, all right, I'm either in or I'm out. Chair one is a good chair to be in. If, and I just want, just want you to listen to me. If, if, you're, if you're an innocent child, I mean, if you're someone that, that, that just hasn't quite grasped what it means to become a Christian, this is a good chair to sit in. You come all the way down to chair number five. Chair number five is another chair that you want to be in. Uh, chair number five is the, uh, is the chair that belongs to the own fire Christian. Maybe you sit here. Maybe this is your seat. Maybe this is where you sit. The own fire Christian. This is the man or woman of God who's given their life to God. Uh, their light is bright. I mean, it's not dim. You know that little song, This Little Light of Mine? You know, they, they don't hide it under a bushel. Satan doesn't blow it out or anything. This is that on fire Christian. This is the person whose who's church attendance is good, who, who, who loves God, who, who spends a lot of time with God during the week. This is the person who's devoted to God. This is the person who, who loves his or her spouse or their children. This is the person that loves their neighbor. This is the person who, uh, who's convicted by the Holy Spirit on a daily basis to produce fruit. You could say, look at this person and say, wow, that person is a, is a Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 kind of Christian. They have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. This person's on fire. And, and I believe that in our building, we have a lot of folks that are like this. I mean, there's a lot of y'all that I look up to. 
I mean, there's a lot of on fire people here. I mean, a lot of people. I mean, there's a lot of people that, that quite honestly, do a lot of good things and no one ever knows about it. See, an on fire Christian really doesn't need a stage. They just very quietly go about serving God and loving people. So, chair number five is a good place to sit in. Um, you heard the invitation in Matthew chapter 11 about being weary and burdened and you accepted it. You walked the narrow, narrow road and you were one of the few that have found it. But then we're left with three chairs. And if you're not innocent, and you're not on fire, then one of these chairs belongs to you. Now the good news is this. Is that you don't have to stay in the same seat. Unlike... Unlike what we do on church on Sunday mornings, like like you know, I've all, I'll never give up my seat on the, the back row next to next to Miss Marie, right? You'll never switch chairs in church, but this is the time that you want to switch chairs. Chair number two. Uh, chair number two is a reserved seat for the lukewarm Christian. This is a chair for the lukewarm person. The person whose light was once bright, but is now dim. It's done out yet, but it's just, it's just dim. In fact, Revelation chapter 3 uh, says this about the lukewarm person. And I know you've, you've heard this before. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 verse 15 I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Written to a church. An entire church. In Laodicea. The second chair is for the lukewarm Christian. A pew warmer. Someone that comes in and takes up a piece of real estate every Sunday morning. Someone who on the sports world would say that they're on the inactive list. Uh, their attendance may be good, but their involvement is very minimal. And what's interesting about the person that sets a number two is usually this doesn't happen overnight. It kind of happens gradually. Gradually this person... This man or woman of God has just slowly become lukewarm. They're not hot. They're not cold. They're just very content to just barely get by. You said in chair number two, that's really not a good place to be. So if you still got that spiritual mirror in front of you, just ask yourself, are you lukewarm? Do you do just enough to get by? Was your light bright, but now it's dim? Just Only you can answer this question. But then you go to chair number three. Chair number three is, uh, is another chair that's not good to sit in. I mean... It's fine to be innocent. It's fine to, you really want to be on fire. You could be lukewarm, or you could be in chair number three. Chair number three is a very difficult chair to get out of because this is the chair of the dead Christian. Uh, this is the chair that belongs to the person who did consciously choose to commit their lives to Christ. They made that conscious choice. Their light was bright. At one point, this person was the the most on-fire Christian that you could ever imagine. This was the person that was involved and, and did, did, did amazing things and served God and loved their neighbor and, and, and loved people around them and, and was willing to do anything. But now this person is just simply, they're just dead. I mean, their light 
was once bright, but now it's completely out. I mean, the lukewarm Christian, their light is dim. But this person, their light's out. I mean, it's over. Uh, this is the person who just simply doesn't play games anymore. I mean, at least the lukewarm guy wears masks and pretends, but this person, I mean, he or she makes no bones about it. They're just simply dead. Uh, in West Nashville, you could say that, that they just don't do squat. I mean, they just, they're just dead. And unfortunately, what happens a lot of times is that the person that sits in chair number three just kind of disappears off of the church roll. Like they just don't exist anymore. And what's really bad about it is most of our churches don't even realize this person's gone. And so... That's a bad thing for this guy who's dead, but it's also a very bad thing for our church, right? I imagine that right now, right now, if you wanted to stop it just, just for a, about 10 seconds, and if you thought about somebody in here that's not here any longer, and if you looked around and you said, oh, he or she hasn't been here, and my goodness, I haven't been here in a long time. Now, the question is, are we doing anything about it? Because this person that sits in this chair, it is extremely difficult to bring him or her back. I mean, this, this is without a doubt. The dead Christian has got to have a, a supernatural intervening of the Holy Spirit. I mean, the person that sits in this chair is dead. And the Holy Spirit's got to come in and convict them of their sin. I mean, you don't want to be here. You don't want to be lukewarm. You don't want to be dead. Then you've got this last chair. And this, we actually may not have many people that are sitting in this chair today. I don't know. I do know that Chairs one, two, three, and five have got some folks sitting in it today. I'm just going to be honest with you. I know we've we've got some lukewarm people in this building. Okay, that's just a fact. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. That's just that's just preaching. Some of y'all are lukewarm, and then we've got some folks that are just dead. And I can't say much about them because they're not here, right? but I do have something to say to us. We better not give up on these people. And then we have this... Like I said, there may not be many people in here that fit this bill. Maybe there are. This is the person that's the non-believer. This is the person that, that has not consciously committed their lives to God. I mean, the lukewarm guy has, the dead person has, but this guy or this lady just hasn't done that. They're a non-believer. They just haven't made that step. They haven't made that commitment. And, and, and they, they, they come to church. They hear the gospel. They, they find out that, that they're a sinner that needs to be saved by grace. They understand that, that they need to consciously make a choice. They need to commit. I mean, you need to be in or out. And, and so this is the person that... Uh, that I know back when I was a kid, um, the preacher at, 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 a, at my church would say, they're the white knucklers. You know, during the imitation song when we're singing, I have decided to follow Jesus, they're the ones that are, that are, that are grabbing the, the back of the pew in front of them. They're just holding on because, man, like, man, I, you know, I know I need to go forward. Man, I know, I know I need to give my life to God. I know I need to do it, but I'm just holding on for dear life. This is the non-believer. A person that needs to step out and make that commitment. Uh, maybe they need a, 
a gentle nudge from the Holy Spirit. Maybe they need the right song sung at the right service. Maybe they need to hear a timely sermon. Maybe they need to hear a word from a believer that can say, hey, you're really missing out on things. I mean, being a Christian is the best thing in life. And so, uh, don't we have five chairs? And you have your own spiritual mirror in front of you? You're either innocent, you're either lukewarm, you're either dead, you're a non-believer, or you're on fire. Now, the, the choice is yours. I mean, the good news is there's no assigned seats. I mean, you're not assigned a seat up here. This is... You get to come into this building. If you were a, 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 a kid at, a, at school, you would get to come into the classroom and you would get to pick your own seat. No assigned seats by the teacher. You get to pick which chair you want to sit in. And some of us are sitting in a chair that we need to get up and move. If you're lukewarm, you need to move. If you're dead, if you're dead, if you know someone that's dead, if you're on the website right now watching this and you're dead, you need to move. If you're a non-believer and you understand what you ought to do, you need to move. So I'm just going to close by answering a really quick question. Why don't we switch chairs? The answer is really simple. For one thing, what keeps us from switching chairs is pride. I don't need God. I can do it on my own. I've been here before it. Sometimes we're just too prideful to change chairs. I mean, you sh surely, if you're a prideful person, if you have an ego the size of Texas, the last thing that you want to do is admit that you've got a problem. But James chapter 4, verse 6 says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So pride is going to... Oh, how am I going to say this without offending you? Maybe I ought to just say it anyway. Pride will send you to hell. Because if you cannot humble yourself before God and get on your, 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 your knees and on your face and say, God, I repent. I want to move. Pride will keep you from committing your life to God. Guilt is another thing that will keep you. You got pride, you have guilt. Uh, sometimes we'll come to God and we'll say, yeah, I've done way too much stuff. I mean, people don't know. I mean, you don't know what I've done. I mean, my sins are, I mean, they're just too many to count. I mean, I, I, I'm lukewarm and dead because of a reason. I mean, I'm, I'm just a wreck. Well, I mean, if, if, if you have so much sin that you can't come to God, what that means is that Jesus' death on the cross just wasn't good enough for you. Jesus loves the broken person. In fact, God is the greatest handyman in the world. He loves working with broken things. But we allow guilt to keep us from switching chairs. Sometimes we allow fear to keep us from switching chairs. We're afraid because maybe we're sitting in one of these chairs, and especially if you're a non-believer, you're, you're sitting here and you're saying, man, I'm afraid if, if I commit my life to Christ right now, if I give my life to Him, I'm afraid. I'm afraid what He's going to do to me. I mean, I mean, if I give my life to God, what's He going to do? Is He going to make me... Is he going to make me go to Thailand as a missionary? Is he going to, is he going to, oh my, is he going to make me a preacher? I mean, am I going to lose friends? Am I going to sacrifice? I mean, what's this going to cost me? And you begin to just try to rationalize things. I'm afraid. 
uh, I'm afraid of what's going to happen. I'm afraid to be a Christian. I mean, I can't give up this world. If you're a non-believer today, I'm just going to just give, very, give you a very simple 30-second commercial on being a Christian. We have hope beyond the grave. We have a love that covers all, and we have the best retirement plan in the world. We have the best parties. As a Christian, I'm a man of joy. There is nothing that this world can throw at me that I cannot overcome. It's either going to make me stronger or I'm going to eventually die. And if I die, guess what I get to do? I'm going home to heaven. So fear can't be part of that. Another thing that keeps us from doing it is worry. And here's what we mean by worry. We confuse the decision-making process with a problem-solving process. We twiddle our thumbs and we worry ourselves to death and say, well, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can commit to God. I don't know. I just don't know. I mean, I, mean, I, I just don't know if I can do this. I mean, if I, if I commit to God, there's going to be a whole list of things that I've got to do. And, and, we just, and we just get ourselves bogged down. Uh, it would be like, uh, it would be like me, and, uh, me and Susie getting together right after Sunday school and we're going to figure out where is Susie? She's over there. We're going to figure out where to go out to eat. And lo and behold, she's already talked to her family, and guess we're going out to lunch. We're going to Cancun, unfortunately. And so, together, we're going to go to Cancun. We make the decision, but I say to Susie, I say, Hey, baby, that's great, but I can't go to Cancun unless I know without a shadow of a doubt that every traffic light is going to be green from here to Cancun. And Susie... I can't go to Cancun unless I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when we get there, we don't have to wait. We just can go straight into line and get the buffet and get all the fajitas. If, if I said that, we would never make it to Cancun. If as a Christian... Yeah, if, as a Christian, you would say, I'm not going to commit my life to God until everything gets right. You're never going to do it. And then finally, uh, there's doubt. Because if you're sitting in one of these chairs and you've got doubts, you might say to yourself, well, <laughs> You know what, my, my faith is too small, I'm, I'm lukewarm, I'm dead, I'm a non believer My faith is too small, I, I just don't know enough. You know, the question is, how much do you need to know in order to become committed to Christ? I believe very little. You need to know that you're lost, that God sent His Son to die for you, and that you need to commit your life to God, that you need to have your sins washed away in baptism. I mean, it's a very simple process. You don't have to know Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. To become a Christian. You just very simply have to say, God, I'm a sinner. I need your son. It's that simple. So this morning, put the mirror back in your face. And ask yourself the question. Which chair am I sitting in? Am I innocent? Am I on fire? Am I lukewarm? Do I just do the minimum? Are you dead? Or are you a non believer? And that's it. Five chairs. Five choices. Three of them you don't want to be in. Two of them are pretty good. Now, before we close, we need to understand that we cannot work our way to heaven. The sermon is not about that. 
not being good enough. But what it is saying is that God does require us to be committed. I mean, God wants us to be committed. He wants us to be all in. And only you know that answer. More than likely, uh, there's only a, a few people in your life that actually know where, which chair you're sitting in. I would imagine your spouse could answer that question for you. Maybe your child could. Wouldn't it be interesting if you were sitting here today and your child was on fire and you weren't? Wouldn't that be interesting? this morning the choice is yours the mirror is in front of you you can move chairs today whether that means you need to come up here publicly and ask the church to pray with you maybe you need to come up here and just tell the church hey I want to rededicate I want to recommit I want to re-up my game I want to move I want you to hold me accountable. Maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe you're sitting here, you've never made that conscious choice. I'm telling you, giving your life to God is without a doubt the greatest thing that you'll ever do in your entire life. I promise you. I promise you. It doesn't mean all the problems are solved, but it does mean you are serving him and that he's got your back so if you could just go ahead and stand with me guys go ahead and put the uh, put the words on the song up there for me we're going to sing I have decided to follow Jesus keep the mirror in front of you sing it make your choice move if you need to I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided.